the fusion between the, these components. In 1989, two physicists from the University of Utah, Dr. Stanley Pons and Dr. Martin Fleshman, created a media frenzy with their announcement of cold fusion in a bottle. Although several independent experiments reported similar test results, the cry of fraud quickly went up at MIT and other prestigious universities. The debunking was swift and merciless. Throughout the history of science, any time there is something that is very threatening to the established ideas, such as Galileo's revelations through the telescope and his idea of following on others that the Earth goes around the sun, not vice versa, continental drift, uh, all sorts of claims that ultimately became validated, the initial reaction of science is to say this is nonsense and to reject it and not even to look at the data. And I would say that the cold fusion and free energy or new energy phenomena are so threatening to the underminings, uh, underpinnings of, of modern physics and chemistry and all other sciences that you, you would get the, you get the expected intensely negative reaction. The real story about cold fusion is that it never died. Soon after the announcement in Utah on March 23, 1989, uh, hundreds, thousands of people all over the world, scientists and engineers, began to try, <clears throat> they began to try to replicate the Pons and Fleischmann experiment. And positive results kept coming in uh, of all manner, uh, including the energy, the excess energy, far more out than in than could be possibly explained by any chemical reaction or any previously stored energy. The unfortunate situation was that the U.S. Department of Energy masterminded a, a bogus panel of so-called experts, who many of whom were biased from the start against the subject. They came up with the expected answer with only, with, within three months, and they ratified it within six months, even as the evidence continued. Those physicists nuclear physicists that have been working with hot fusion, the tokamaks, this type of thing, they have a monstrous amount of evidence that shows exactly what they expect to have happen with nuclear reactions in this hot gas plasma. They believe, and it's a good, a good first guess, that the nuclear reactions that would occur in a cold fusion cell should be the same. Well, Mother Nature doesn't always accept our predispositions to, to belief. Therefore, Mother Nature says, this is a different environment, these are different reactions, and hey guys, start studying a little harder and find out what's going on. The problems that occur in evaluating a cold fusion device have not been so much, does it work, but does it work every time? And many, uh, many scientists are of the opinion that if it doesn't work every time, then there's something wrong. Uh, basically, the problem has been in the preparation of the metal. Now, this is particularly true in the heavy water experiments of Pons and Fleischmann. Certain materials will just absolutely uh, close off the effect of the cells. Other things that are finding additions will promote the effect. So there's a lot of study going on in that area. So over 200 laboratories in over 30 countries have replicated or advanced or, or, or had successes in various types of cold fusion devices. The Patterson Power Cell of Clean Energy Technologies of Dallas, Texas is one of the most spectacular devices in the cold fusion field. It also happens to be the first device that has a United States patent, which is also very important. It got it almost by accident since there are hundreds of patent applications that the patent office is rejecting. What this cell is, is it's very similar to the Pons and Fleischmann concept, except it uses tiny little metal coated beads with either nickel, palladium nickel, or even sometimes just nickel, and ordinary water, not the heavy water, uh, which Pons and Fleischmann started with. Uh, and it does produce, with a flowing stream of this liquid, or electrolyte, uh, with just a little bit of uh, lithium sulfate salt mixed in it, uh, it produces spectacular energy. In, in fact, in one experiment, uh, they turn the power off completely, and the cell continued to produce 20 watts of power, unmistakable, for uh, at least 14 hours. And my understanding is that could go on for a number of days longer. Uh, the typical uh, power ratios of this kind of a cell 
that's very robust, totally repeatable, is anywhere from uh, 10 to 1,000 to 1, okay, when you have even a tiny bit of input power. They've had it go over 1,000 watts with only a watt or so input electricity. Clearly, these cells can be made to self-sustain, that is, continue by themselves. Dennis Cravens is an independent scientist who has done first-hand research studying the effects of the Patterson power cell. The important thing is, uh, notice over here, total excess energy is usually in the megajoules range. If you run through a chemical calculation of how much metal you have in there, about 20 milligrams, turn the crank, how many moles is that, how much, you assume about 100 kcal per mole for you chemist types of a typical energetic reaction, if you can think of one, we can't think of one, but if there was one, uh, you maybe get 32 kcals if you burned all the metal. So we are three or four orders of magnitude more energy out of the system, integrated energy out, than if we were burning everything chemically. If you do the calculations, you'll find that you can't get there. It's more likely that a few percentage of them are in the millions of electron volt region. It's been revealed recently that the uh, Patterson cell will actually keep producing heat for at least 14 hours after it's shut off. This is a phenomenal discovery. It has not been advertised or publicized very well. But what that means is we're actually dealing with a free energy source. Uh, the inventors never use that phrase and for obvious purposes. Um, but the important thing is that it does need more understanding and, and also it has the keys to our um, uh, the type of device that we need. The interesting thing about the Patterson cell, too, is that as a byproduct, it produces hydrogen and oxygen. It's actually using water, any type of water, and electrolyzing that water, and then just exhausting the hydrogen and oxygen. Now, we could see two views of that. For example, if we're actually forced into a situation where we're in an enclosed space and uh, not able to um, spend too much time outdoors, which we already spend 90% indoors anyways, um, the uh, supply of oxygen is uh, very valuable, uh, whether or not we even use the hydrogen. <clears throat> but it's possible we could also store the hydrogen and therefore have hydrogen-powered vehicles and use the oxygen indoors. Another area that has emerged as a result of cold fusion, which is every bit as uh, heretical and disastrous to the scientific enterprise, as the over unity and the greater energy out than in is the transmutation of metals uh, that is heavy metals in ordinary cold fusion experiments they have now seen in the metal changes in elements for example the production of copper the production of other isotopes such as rhodium uh, the change of palladium into other things uh, this is confirmed, there's no doubt about it, and it's occurring with minimal energy input. So what this leads to is an analogy with the old claims of the alchemists, who were able, uh, historically, they said, and there's some evidence that they were able to do it, to do low energy processes that produced gold from lead or mercury or other things. Um, this is now being done in laboratories, and every instance I know of in the history of science where a small effect was seen initially to produce something was later scaled up. So there's, it's quite possible that our culture will enter an age of alchemy in which low energy processes can make precious metals. As we look toward the future, I believe we'll be able to find ways in which we can create the kind of elements that we need by these low-energy nuclear reactions. I think we'll be able to start adding to or picking apart or changing the nucleus of atoms to be able to get the kind of stable atoms that we need. But more important, I thoroughly believe that we will be able to take the radioactive materials, add a proton or add some changes to it, and make those radioactive materials non-radioactive. And that is going to be a great boon to our present uh, 
right uh, to our to clean up the mess that we've left behind from our atomic bombs from our nuclear power plants and of course from things like chernobyl so in the future we have laid the groundwork with cold fusion by which we'll be able to handle a whole array of nuclear changes that heretofore have been have been outside of the current model of what can be done with nuclear reactions. There are many power companies throughout the United States that are now on alert and they're sending their representatives to coal fusion conferences. We meet them all the time. They give support. They, um, they really will be the vanguard of uh, the new energy age. Uh, I believe that uh, any utility company that does not get into this now is doomed because frankly when we have generators of electricity and heat that can stay in a home or a building uh, why would anyone want to be plugged into the grid the wire grid any longer this would make no sense people will argue against that but I think the grid will disappear a remarkable process for sure and one that offers exciting developments in the near future but does the task of extracting energy from our environment really require such exotic, ultra-advanced technology that potentially would still put it under the control of large profit-driven interest? The rare metal palladium still have to be prospected, mined, and purified. Or are there simpler in design, low-maintenance technologies available that could be bought off the shelf and installed by anyone for an affordable one-time fee? We're going to look in depth at several individuals and companies who have been working for years perfecting devices that they claim will do just that. No one person in the free energy field has been as determined and persistent as Mississippi inventor Joseph Newman. Since the 70s, Newman has been denied U.S. patents repeatedly on his energy machine, even though numerous engineers, scientists, and even congressmen have testified on his behalf. In 1968, I invented uh, a bike that would get a wheelie. And I used an 80-pound flywheel that I had built and took a positive plus out of a 30-horsepower motor, put it above the axis of the back wheel. A kid would get up on it, build up inertia in that 80-pound flywheel. He'd engage that positive clutch. Immediately, the front end jump up off the ground. It'd leave black six on the pavement about that long, and the kid's eyes would be, you know, get as big as a silver dollar. They were just ecstatic over it. But I had heard the word that a gyroscope was a stabilizer. So I went to the library, got a book on gyroscopes. And when I started reading the mechanical characteristics of a gyroscope, the question that had dogged my mind for three years, how did that current know which direction to go? And why was, it, why was it when you went parallel, you'd get nothing? I saw the laws of a gyroscope match that exactly. If you study the laws of a gyroscope, if you take uh, this little uh, gyroscope here, 